the fast food chain is the new ground zero in the culture wars over gay marriage. I think we're inviting God's judgment on our nation when we shake our fist at him and say, you know, we know better than you as to what constitutes a marriage. So you're better than me? Absolutely not. But you're okay, trying to so make what? yourselves better than us. This was not a protest. It was an affirmation of the right of an owner of a business to speak his or her uh, convictions. Chick-fil-A's values are not Chicago values. We are Chicago! A city built on gambling, corruption, murder, and ballot stuffing. Not intolerance. Chick-fil-A Appreciation Day set sales records on Wednesday. We'll get into that controversy coming up. Let's introduce the roundtable now. Joined, as always, by George Will. Steve Ratner, former car czar, investor now. Jonathan Carl covers Congress and politics for us. Also, Van Jones, former Obama advisor, now the head of Rebuild the Dream. Also authored a book, same name, and Ann Coulter, whose book, Demonic, How the Liberal Mob is Endangering America, now out in paperback. Thanks to all of you for coming in. Today and George, let's start out uh, on the economy coming off that Friday unemployment report. You know, you look at it and you see some good news and bad news for either political side there. What I take away from it is basically we have the economy, the economic table is set pretty much going into the election. Yes, July was the 42nd consecutive month of unemployment over 8%, which means October we can be fairly sure will be the 45th consecutive month. Each of these is a record. Back up a little bit. In 2011, we created on average 153,000 jobs a month. In 2012, so far, 51,000 a month. 172,000 this most recent month. That means we're creating 50,000 more jobs a month than necessary to just to keep pace with the growth of the workforce. That means if we're going to reduce this ocean of unemployment out there in increments of 50,000 a month would take us 10 years. If you doubled our rate of job creation, it would take us three years. So this is not a happy picture. No way it could be under 8% on election day. I wouldn't say no way. It's 8.2%. It could be 0.3%. It could go down a little bit. But uh, the fact is, I think this was unambiguously a pretty good month, 160,000 plus new jobs. Uh, uh, and most of them in the private sector. In fact, more than 100% of them in the private sector. And it's slow. I don't disagree with George. It's slow, but I think we're making slow, steady progress. Um, I don't think there's any way to make these numbers look good, but this is the recovery from, from the recession. The recovery, you're supposed to be, it's supposed to be the second two years of Reagan. This is supposed to be the 1984 election for Obama. And no matter how you talk about the numbers and adding these jobs or those jobs, everyone knows people are out of work, which is really going to color this whole campaign. You often hear it said um, by the the party, the person out of party running, well, my opponent can't run on his record, so that's why he's going to talk about, you know, personal attacks. It's actually true this time. Obama cannot run on his record, which is why they're so obsessed with the tax records, which is why Romney has to be careful who he picks for vice president. No scandals, because that's all Obama's going to talk in, about. We're going to get into a lot. One of the points that Ann makes, Van, is that Ronald Reagan was able to win, even with 7.2 percent unemployment back in 1984, because the trend was in, in much better shape than what the president is seeing now. Well, sure, but the, the, the good news here is, first of all, no double dip. The, the, the danger going into this month was, w w if we saw again uh, this month what we saw last month, maybe you got a double dip recession right in the middle of November. That's game over. There will be no double dip. We are still adding jobs. I think the other thing, too, who are you comparing Obama to? He's created 4.5 million private sector jobs in four years, which is better than George Bush in eight, number one. And number two, Romney says he's a job creator, but when you look at his performance in Massachusetts, his state fell to number 47 out of 50 in job creation on his watch. America is going this way. We don't want to fall to number 47 out of 50 globally. I think we're moving in the right direction here. And both sides, John and Carl, are starting to talk more about their plans. I want to get to the tax plans in a second. But first, this whole um, back and forth over Harry Reid and the tax returns. You cover Capitol Hill every day. You've been covering Harry Reid an awful long time. What do you make of how he's doubling and tripling down on this charge without releasing any evidence? Well, well, first of all, it's one of the most outrageous charges that I've ever seen actually made on the Senate floor. Sometimes you see this stuff out, you know, you know he, for, first it was an interview with Huffington Post, that's one thing. But when Harry Reid comes to the floor of the Senate and makes this outrageous charge that has absolutely no evidence, I mean, Mitt Romney paid $3 million to the IRS in the one tax return that we've seen so far. He paid taxes. It's, 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 it's a completely false charge. But Reid loves it. The Democrats love this because 
no matter you know how much he, he digs in, no matter how much he gets attacked, uh, you know here or by John Stewart or, or anywhere else, it gets the story out there again and again. And I'll tell you, Romney played into it by telling Harry Reid to put up or shut up, and then it becomes this back and forth. Instead, he should have laughed it off. He should have made a joke about Harry Reid's imaginary friend uh, and 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 moved on because it's just it's just you know it's an unbelievable. Is John right about that? Harry Reid's source, if we're to assume he actually has one. <laughs> is identified by Harry Reid as an investor in a bank. That's as though I own some Microsoft stock, which I do, and I said, well, as an investor in Microsoft, I now have opinions on Bill Gates' tax returns. Look, in 1950, Joe McCarthy went to West Virginia, didn't know what to tell the Women's Republican Club of Wheeling, West Virginia, so he said, I have in my hand a list of 205, we think, the reports, 205 communists in the State Department didn't have a list. Harry Reid doesn't have any evidence either. This is McCarthyism from the desert. Look, I, I don't disagree with either of you guys about Harry Reid. I don't think it was appropriate, but you still come back to the question why won't he release his tax returns? If he's paid all the taxes he says he's paid, he said he's paid a lot of taxes every year, why not just release them and move on and, and end this discussion? And it is true, Ann Coulter, that even though Mitt Romney did tell David Muir, ABC's David Muir last week, that he would show that he's pay, paid more than 13.9% at various times, he said he went back and checked, nothing's come out. No, Since then, can he hold he on to this position? He absolutely should not release any more tax returns. He's released two years. Bill Clinton wouldn't release his medical records. You know, people have kind of wondered about that. We know after the JFK presidency, you could have an issue with a drug addict president, but he just dug in his heels for the first time Clinton. ever. No, but he's not releasing his tax returns. That is something the American people should have known. We didn't even get two years. We have two years, Romney. You know perfectly well the media, this is Obama's modus operandi, and unfortunately, Romney isn't divorced. Hopefully, his vice presidential candidate won't be divorced. It's always dirty politics. Do you remember when, when Romney was, or uh, Obama was running against McCain and Sarah Palin? What did we get? False rumors of a McCain affair. We had um, investigations into the Palin marriage, claims they were getting divorced. They have nothing on this Mormon, and they want his tax records. If he releases 10 years, they'll demand 20 years. McCain got 23. Oh, oh, yeah, I mean, and, and as uh, James Carville famously said, the only person who's seen his tax returns, which, which is John McCain, saw 23 years of tax returns, and then picked Sarah Palin. So there's something that, that's being hidden here. But you know what? Nothing this is, is being <laughs> hidden. <laughs> well, 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 then why didn't, it's, not, it's certainly not being revealed, but hold on a second. <laughs> but this is the kind of stuff I think that turns people off from politics. I mean, this is exactly the problem that we have right now. Ordinary people don't care about this stuff. And the stuff that, that regular people care about more than anything else is, you know, their houses. Right now, one third of the people who are watching this show, their homes are underwater. It used to be, they were talking about the, the, the good old days earlier on the show. It used to be when you, when you signed that mortgage check, you were building wealth for your family. You got a third of Americans who are losing wealth. In Washington, D.C., the big story that was missed, you've got Ed DeMarco, a Bush administration holdover who's still being held onto by Obama, who sits back and says, Fannie and Freddie are now... He's the head of the Federal Housing Administration. Head of the Federal Housing Administration. Oversees Fannie and Freddie. Fannie and Freddie came up with a report that said if they just reduce some of these um, uh, mortgages and gave some mortgage relief and stopped overcharging people for their homes, uh, they, it, America would save a billion dollars in foreclosures and you keep people in their houses. This one bureaucrat says no way, takes it off the table. That's wrong. That's hurting ordinary Americans. It's not even being talked about in Washington, D.C. President Obama should fire Ed DeMarco, get him out of there, put somebody in office who's going to take care of the real issues. The American people cannot continue to lose their shirts trying to, keep, trying to stay in their houses. You suppose Those the president didn't, didn't do more about, about that? On I the know he disagrees, Congress? yeah. I know he disagrees with Ed DeMarco, but he didn't take any well, action. Look, the housing situation is one of the most complicated policy issues we have because we all would like to do more for homeowners. But I think there's a feeling in America, which I understand, of sort of, of equity in the sense that uh, someone who overborrowed, who took out a second mortgage, used it to uh, buy a new television or consume, and is now underwater, uh, is living next door to somebody who acted responsibly and didn't take out a second mortgage. And so this is a highly emotional issue in Washington. The, the, the great thing about the report that they came out was that if you, if you narrowed it to people who are not in that situation, 
you'd actually save a billion dollars for Americans. So you've taken that out of the table. You're not talking about people who, who overboard. You're talking about the responsible people. They can't get help from, from this administration. They can't get help from Washington, D.C. That's why you're going to have underwater voters sitting out this election in droves. That hurts the president, and their inability to be a part of the economy hurts the economy. You have more I jobs created if you do this. I don't believe these are families. I think they're all house flippers. You notice that all the housing crisis, they won't give you the numbers. How many of these houses that are underwater are second homes? But noticeably, all the housing crisis hotspots, Arizona, Nevada, California, Florida, it's not New York City, it's the hotspots for a house well, flippers. This is what we should be talking about. These are the issues we should be 70, talking about, not this other stuff. Seventy-five percent of mortgage holders who are underwater are are continuing to pay their mortgages. Yes. If you get into now competitive debt forgiveness, the president's hinting that maybe student loans should now be forgiven, maybe now we're going to start forgiving this, breaking contracts in a sense what they are, then you're going, to, you're going to have a classic case of moral hazard where the incentives are for perverse behavior and you're going to incentivize the 75 percent of honorable people paying their mortgages to stop. Let's talk about the broader tax plans that each campaign has. And, you know, the president sending, putting out ads against Mitt Romney's tax plan this week. We just, you saw me talk to Reince Priebus about that Tax Institute study. And, 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 and George, let me ask you uh, about this. You heard what Priebus said back. The Tax Institute, though, does have a reputation for nonpartisanship. They did make the assumption that there would be some economic growth, yet they still come up with the conclusion that it's mathematically impossible for Mitt Romney, if he has those big tax cuts for the wealthy, not to raise taxes for the middle class. Is he going to have to do a better job of responding to that? What he's going to have to do a better job of is responding in some detail to the loopholes that he plans to close, because that's the heart of the matter. Now, we had a little experience with that this week. The Finance Committee, this is the time of year when they do the extenders. They extend all these special tax breaks that never should have been passed in the first place. Let me give you one example. Mitt Romney has come out against extending, as he should, the wind power tax break. It costs $1.8 billion a year. On the Senate Finance Committee, the vote was 19 to 5 to extend it. Half the Republicans on the committee voted for this bit of industrial policy, the government picking winners and losers. The Republicans are just as bad, just as unreliable as the Democrats. Yes, but the problem with this, George, as you just actually said, is that is a $1.5 billion a year item. Mitt Romney's tax plan would cost $360 billion in 2015. The only way you can pay for that, as the Tax uh, Policy Center found, was to eliminate 65% of all the loopholes. And we say loopholes, we're not talking about corporate jets, we're not talking about oil and gas. We're talking about home interest mortgage deductions. We're talking about the fact that your health care benefits are not taxed. We're talking about the fact that your 401ks and your IRAs are not taxed. So let's assume even that people are willing to accept that politically, you then get to a situation where actually that hurts the middle and lower class much more than it hurts you and me. And the fact is that under Romney's tax plan, only people making over $200,000 a year would actually end up ahead. Everybody below $200,000 a year would end up behind. And those are the facts. And as you pointed out, George, the head of this tax policy center was a member of President Bush's Council of Economic Advisors. You know, we've never seen a presidential election decided by a Brookings Institution study. <laughs> but, uh, but, but I think Chicago's going to try. I mean, the Obama campaign has made it clear that this study is something that they're, and, and its findings, something they're going to talk about from now until November. But the other thing to consider is the utter implausibility of the Obama plan as well. I mean, the idea that you can simply tax the rich and end up getting the budget anywhere near to balance. I mean, let's face it, both of these guys have presented plans without much detail that are utterly implausible. I mean, and frankly, I think both of them, when they actually get into office, either one, I mean, from the next, next term, you're going to have to raise taxes. The, the, the difference, though, is that you have Obama putting forward a plan that would raise taxes on himself, and you have Romney putting forward a, tan, a plan that would cut taxes for him and raise taxes on everybody else. But you're not so, going to so, get the budget in so, the balance by raising taxes well, on Barack well, but, Obama. But, 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 but you're we're talking about two different things here. We have a problem with Mitt Romney because it seems that Mitt Romney doesn't understand what ordinary people are going through. He's talking, he, he has these magical mystery numbers about, oh, we're just going to close loopholes. When you dig down into it, the, the levels of what he's talking about, what he's calling loopholes, as you were saying, is what ordinary people rely on uh, to keep moving forward in the economy. So I, th I think what you've got here is do you want to elect somebody who won't tell you how much money he's making, who won't give you his tax returns, but does, with all he's put on paper, will cut his taxes and raise yours? That's the real question. I 
I think the point isn't whether a Barack Obama's personal taxes get raised. <laughs> we have to run this behemoth Neverland Ranch of Washington, D.C. And the main point is cutting the size of government. I mean, even when Obama famously froze federal government salaries, remember that? Um, when he first came into office, that's his big fiscal austerity. That didn't freeze their salaries. They still get their automatic pay increases that go into effect every year. You have the government running around having these huge conferences in Las Vegas and, and Mexico, that is what Romney is selling. He is the Bain guy. He's going to cut down this ridiculously sized government. Did you see the story today with the Amtrak food cart with $10 two-week-old turkeys? They're losing $80 million a year. They're only open a week, an hour a week. That George is the go how the government <laughs> runs things, and that's what you need, some a Bain guy to come in and cut the size of government, not just keep figuring out how can we get more money to the fund The question this. is, though, how plausible is getting to your point about the tax extenders, George? I saw one study Center for Budget and Policy priorities, liberal leaning, but seen as credible uh, from both sides of the aisle, saying that if you take Romney's assumptions, you're talking about a 49% cut in everything that's non-defense. That's simply never going to happen. And all the money is, as Steve said, it's in really two big ones, the mortgage interest deduction and the non-taxing of employer-provided health insurance. There are zero votes in Congress for either, for cutting either of those, zero. So, so if there's zero votes in Congress for cutting either of those, then how does you make up the revenue, the $360 billion that's lost by Romney's tax cuts? He's not going to pass and, and the, a lot and, of and, that and, stuff. And, but, and the, the other problem that you have, which again, I think ordinary people care about is, you got, a, if, if this bill goes through, if his budget goes through, good analysts say you're going to lose 4 million jobs right away. We just, we had to fight to get 4.5 million jobs. This is a, his, not only is this tax plan for him, going to cut his own taxes and raise yours, he's also going to wipe out four million jobs. What jobs? Will you lose government jobs? Cutting taxes creates jobs. That's why we like cutting taxes. Look, look, all, all the analysts show, when you look, look at, the, at the Ryan budget and all the stuff that's in, in, inspired by that stuff, you wind up losing jobs. These are, these are jobs. Government this, jobs. No, no, We're not, for no, losing no, government hey, listen, jobs. We, we can, we can, we can, have, we can have, have this fight right here, right, right now. The, the, the real tax, uh, the real job creators are middle class people who go out there and, and buy products and spend money. That's what creates jobs. That gives entrepreneurs the opportunity to go out there and sell something to somebody. Well, also I, want to get to the next, okay. I want to get to the next big decision Mitt Romney has to make, choosing a vice presidential uh, running mate, John Carr. You're covering this for us. You saw me ask uh, Ryan's previous about the bold versus boring yeah. pick. And that is, we are in that final four or five right now, right? I, I absolutely think that's the case. Right now, the big decision facing Mitt Romney is, does he go with solid and safe? Does he pick Tim Pawlenty or Rob Portman? Or does he go big and bold? And the, and the two names that you see there are Paul Ryan or uh, Marco Rubio. And I can tell you that right now, uh, they are looking at the big and bold, and I think that by the, the big and day, bold. I think by the day, the chances of big and bold are more plausible. When you see uh, Romney behind in virtually all the battleground states, uh, he's, being, he's being urged by some very prominent voices within the Republican Party to go big and bold. And the, the message that's come back to us, particularly Marco Rubio supporters, is a reassurance from the Romney campaign: he is under serious consideration. That said, George. If you talk to Republicans close to Romney, still the overwhelming expectation is that he goes with one of the Even safe picks. Even though there's increasing pressure but, but, for but, the bold. But there is increasing pressure, and I think, and I think an increasing chance. The what question is, what is the Romney campaign assumption about the basic dynamic of this race? If they assume that the accumulating bad economic numbers will push him across the finish line, then... Which has been their assumption. Which has been their assumption. Then, fine, go with, with safe and cautious. If not... If you think that uh, at this point in the summer it is time to change the basic perception of Romney himself as someone risk averse in a country that needs risk taken, then bold would measure up. And I think uh, the longer it takes, the more bold may rise. And I would add to that list, of course, Bobby Jindal. Uh, so, but do, you, do you accept the premise that Ryan and Rubio though, are probably at the top of that list? I have no, no way of knowing. Well, I'd say two things. First, uh, when you look at the polls, it suggests that the public doesn't feel quite as bad about the economy as maybe some of the people sitting next to me do, uh, and including the president's handling of the economy. He gets decent marks. The public still blames most of this problem on the previous administration and the mess that he inherited. I personally would love to see him pick Paul Ryan, because then we could actually have a discussion about Romney's economic plan, which he isn't discussing, because I think when people actually understand his plan, they'll understand all the tax things we talked about. They'll understand the spending implications of the Ryan budget plan, in terms of what it does to Medicare privatizing it, what it does to Medicaid, turning it into a block grant program, 
And the 33% cuts that are going to occur in a whole series of programs, including things like food stamps, just to make his numbers work. So I would welcome Ryan and the discussion we'd and, have about it. And the counter-argument there is that Paul Ryan is the best person to defend his own plan, and, the, and Romney's going to get saddled with it anyway. Uh, I think that's right, and you kind of want to keep Rubio and Ryan where they are. I don't think it's so much bold versus drab um, as whether whether Mitt Romney needs someone who will galvanize the base. And I do not think he needs that. I think the base is, the base definitely needed galvanizing with John McCain. I wasn't going to vote for John McCain until he picked Palin. The base is galvanized <laughs> by Obamacare. That is not what you need here. What you need, because the way Barack Obama runs for office, is to go into the divorce records of the man he's running against. He needs someone that has no scandal, that is purer <laughs> than Caesar's wife. That's all he needs. And it's not going to be your choice, kind. Rice. It won't be Condi Rice, and I have to say I'm heartbroken and disappointed by it. You talk, you talk about... Are you sure about that? Well, I, 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 no, nobody's talking about it anymore, but I, I was oh. proud to be the first person on this show to, to put her in, <laughs> and now you know, maybe she's going to get taken out, but there's always 2000, 2016. She's not divorced. She could be a good There's always 2016. Before we go, George, Jane Coulter talks about energizing the base. I think we saw one base that was certainly energized this week by the... Uh, uh, in Texas, the Tea Party had a big victory mm -hmm. by the election of Ted, Ted Cruz, who's going to be the Republican Senate nominee, almost certainly the next senator in Texas. Yes, this is another example of journalistic malpractice in this country. The constant writing off of the Tea Party, which just goes about its business of electing senators. They'll elect Cruz, <laughs> they'll probably elect Murdoch in Indiana, they'll probably elect uh, Deb Fisher in Nebraska. Often, George, the most interesting and important fights in American politics are not between the parties, they're within the parties. People say to uh, 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 about Ted Cruz, well, he's part of the anti-intellectual Tea Party. <laughs> well, Princeton, Harvard, clerk for Justice Rehnquist, I don't think so. National then they say, champion. <laughs> then they say, well, he doesn't play well with others. And the people of Texas said, he doesn't play well with others? Send him to Washington. <laughs> John Carr, you've, got a, you've got a couple more primaries coming up, Missouri and also Wisconsin, where Tommy Thompson, the former governor, facing some trouble as well from Tea Party challengers. Yeah, and, and I would say just, just uh, you know, Deb Fisher in Nebraska, not exactly a Tea Party candidate, uh, although she was endorsed by Sarah Palin. And here, Sarah Palin is four for four on her Senate endorsements. Uh, but they are not all Tea Partiers. I mean, she endorsed Warren Hatch. Uh, and, and Fisher in Nebraska was not endorsed by any of the Tea Party groups. Uh, so it's a bit of a mixed record. But I tell you, the big difference this year, George, is that none of the, we have no uh, people uh, in here like O'Donnell or Angle. There are no uh, Tea Party candidates getting nominated that seem clearly headed towards Ted defeat. Cruz's victory party, they serve Chick-fil-A. Which <laughs> <laughs> brings us to the last one. Angle, I want to talk to you about that, Ann Coulter. We did see those record sales at Chick-fil-A on Wednesday. Kind of a flame out for the counter kiss. In, and I just wonder, what does that tell you about uh, the gay marriage issue going in to the election? Um, it, it, it tells me something about polls generally because they keep taking you know, like Gallup polls showing, oh, gay marriage is so popular. Well, every time people have been allowed to vote on gay marriage, and that's in about 35 states now, it has lost. It has lost in, in Oregon, in Washington, in, in California. Um, and now you see this guy, and I actually liked what he said because he made it clear it wasn't an anti-gay thing. He said, look, all the founders of this company are married to our first wives. It is genuinely a pro-marriage position to oppose gay marriage. And when you see crowds like that coming out, no, I'm sorry, I don't believe the polls on gay mayors. Let us vote. Those polls, I believe, and it makes me suspicious of the polls on the presidential election. Well, th this, this became not an issue about marriage equality. Uh, it became an issue about free speech, and appropriately so. Once the mayor stepped in, you think that was a mistake? I think it was a huge mistake, <laughs> because once the mayor stepped in and said, we're going to use the power of the government to punish people who, because they have a different opinion, then the entire country had to stand uh, against that kind of abuse of authority. However, uh, I think you know, citizen boycotts of, of, of a Chick-fil-A or any other uh, company that you don't agree with, that's appropriate. Citizen boycotts appropriate. Government stepping in, not appropriate. But, but, but you know, uh, George Soros uh, is, the, is the dominant owner of Dinosaur Barbecue in Syracuse, uh, New York. A great that. barbecue place. There are, there are a few others in New York State. And I, I know a lot of conservatives that love Dinosaur Barbecue, eat Ben and Jerry's ice cream. And I, you know, I think it's, it, 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 there's something a little bit odd about I our politics through our, through our restaurants. Yeah, maybe Ann will never go again. But you know, I mean. <laughs>